Let's pray. Lord God, uh, we thank you for this chance to study your word tonight. Thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you for the wonderful kindness that we share within your church family. I, I'm feeling personally thankful tonight for this kind birthday celebration that you have brought to me through your people. Thank you. And we also celebrate Gaynelle's birthday tonight. Lord, thank you for another year of life that you granted to her and the ways that she's been a blessing to all of us. Uh, bless us now as we study your word and, and let it bear fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy birthday, All right. Gabriel. Thank you. And I forgot my iPad, which has my notes. So in for what take one minute, page through Esther one through three, and maybe write just a sentence or two summary or important thing that you wanted to remember, and we'll come back together. So those who weren't here, we can catch them up really quick. And then we've got maybe the most exciting three chapters ahead of us tonight. In the whole which is true. It's the chapters I thought we were going to do. Use these uh, characters to help you. See if you can remember who all these people are. We need to ask for Yep. Mm -hmm. So we finished that sheet last time, but that might jog your memory. Thank you. We already have a thing coming up. All right. What do you got? Human will does not deserve God's will. Mm. That's a good one. Yeah, we see they said human will does not usurp God's will. Yeah, we see uh God's providence, his care and working in all things, definitely President <laughs> Esther. And he's working through even like stuff that isn't so good, like Xerxes, you know, just doing his beauty pageant for all these, his new wife. Well, beauty pageant's a very nice way to say it, but yet God worked through that to bring salvation for his people. Well, salvation from this, this specific thing, this danger to the Jewish people. All right, thank you. Any other thoughts from the first three chapters? or summaries. That's a great summary of the theme. Um, let's just do a really fast rehash then of, of where we've been for those who weren't here. So we've got Xerxes didn't like Queen Vashti because she didn't perform in front of his people, his men at his party. So he gets rid of her. He wants to have this beauty pageant to find a new, new queen. Esther joins that beauty pageant, a Jewish woman, hides her identity. Um, and then she wins the king's favor, becomes the, the king's new queen. And then we have Mordecai, who uh, was Esther's cousin and uh, was, was keeping track of her throughout this whole thing. He has a, a high position as well in the government. Not nearly as high, though, as Haman. We were introduced to Haman in chapter three, I believe. Yep, just as we were starting that chapter. And we see that Haman hates the Jews. And he is the second in command to, to uh, Xerxes, it seems like, kind of like his prime minister. And one day Mordecai does not bow down to Haman or bend the knee, we should say, didn't bend the knee to Haman. This makes him so angry that he decides not only will he get revenge on Mordecai, but he will get revenge on all of Mordecai's people because he already sees them as a hindrance to the Persian empire and all these other things. So he convinces King Xerxes and if you remember, he he didn't even use the Jews by name. So who, it could be that he even tricked Xerxes into condemning the Jews if maybe he wouldn't have even done that. But whatever it is, they put out a decree that says on this certain day, everyone is able to plunder and kill and annihilate the Jews. Uh, and that day, remember, they, they cast a lot for it, which is called a, a pur or pure, we should say. Um, and we maybe, I don't remember if we talked about this providential moment, but when he cast a lot for when this would happen, it landed as far away from the day as it possibly could have. They were in the first month, the lot landed on the 12th month. So God, once again, we like we said, as we dig into Esther, we see more and more coincidences, but we learn that, wow, God's providence, he's working in all these things. So even that gave plenty of time for Esther's plan and Mordecai's plan to go into effect to save his people. Um, what's funny, though, is we're, we're seeing today the theme is going to be dramatic irony. 
you remember, like Shakespeare was the king of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is when we know something that the character doesn't. And we're going to get that a ton with Haman. And this is kind of the first one. He thinks like probably thinks this is a great thing. You know, we've got plenty of time to prepare for this an annihilation of the Jews, make sure the edict gets out to the whole empire. But really what it is, it's going to be great time for this plan, God's plan to work for his people. Um, so that's about where we've been. We, we see that Mordecai makes this plan. Uh, any major points we want to bring up or, or make sure we don't miss? Remember, Mordecai did a good thing to help Xerxes when there was a plan to assassinate him. He overheard it and told the plot to Esther, who told it to Xerxes. That's going to come up again. If not, then we will get started on the next chapter. And uh, because this is so much narrative, I thought tonight we should listen. Uh, we've got, this is kind of a fun time to see, to show you how there are lots of different audio Bibles out there. One of them that I like to use for Esther, and we used it for, um, in, in confirmation class when we studied Esther, is this is called the NIV Dramatized. So you're going to hear some interesting voices, maybe a little overdone. But Haman especially makes me laugh. You'll see. Uh, he's got the evil in his voice, that's for sure. Right? So we'll begin and we'll read Esther 4 all the way through and we'll then study it together. Let me just pull it back up here. All right, Esther chapter 4. Everybody there, if you're in these Bibles, it's on page 707. Esther 4. 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. All right. So yeah, lots going on here. Some tense moments. You see now why this book is was made into so many movies and adaptations. You know, there's just a lot of drama here. This this moment where Mordecai realizes something can be done because Esther has this position as queen. Uh, anything that you noticed in there want to talk about specifically? Well, her fasting, the fasting part. Yeah, the fasting. And the fact that she sent clothes to uh, Mordecai. He was up there with sackcloth on. She didn't want she didn't want him to for anybody to know he was Jewish because he wasn't supposed to have mm -hmm. his sackcloth and ashes, you know, doing that. So she sent clothes to him, and he yeah. still kept his clothes on. Yeah, yeah, that could be. And and maybe part of it, too, is maybe she didn't understand why he was in. Because it seems like there wasn't a lot of communication channel with him. 
was for her uh, until she asked about why, you know, why is he going through all this? So why was she going through? It doesn't mention God at all. And it's, it seems to be a deliberate decision by the author to sh let us see God in everything in this. It's working things. And this is a spot where it comes so close. Uh, we know from the Old Testament, from the Mosaic Law and all these things that so often fasting would be accompanied with prayer. And so it seems here that this certainly would have been included prayer and fasting. Their whole Jewish idea of fasting was this humbling before God for a time of prayer and a time of distress. Uh, the often ashes were a sign of repentance before God, um, recognizing a, a sorrow or, or a need for him. So we see all of these things that normally accompany devotion to God, prayer to God, but those things aren't mentioned. So I, I found it. Yeah, go ahead. She said, fast for me. You see what I'm saying? Is that the mm -hmm. same thing like I said, pray for I me? Mean, yeah. So, yeah, it would it'd be the same thing. Like she's saying, wow, this is a daunting task. I'll do it, but be praying, you know, and get other people to be praying too. Uh, it's a similar thing that maybe we would want to do before we go into a surgery or something, asking people to pray for us. Here it's, it's saying fast and pray because the Jewish nation is at stake. Yeah. I would mention that that's not a proper excuse to just be with the leader. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like in other denominations, Christian areas, especially like Eastern Orthodoxy, like fast. Like, yeah, still do it today. Yeah. yeah. We don't see it as much in our in our circles, maybe as much, but it's, it's certainly a thing that could be blessed. You know, if you decide to, yeah. it, it's a good time to remember no, our, our need and ultimate need and reliance is on God and not on even food and drink. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you see it too at Easter time. Sometimes people fast on Good Friday or they say, I won't eat, or, you know, mm -hmm. different denominations do that. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. Yeah, and it definitely has has credence in the Bible. We see people doing it. It's not a, a command anymore, but it is certainly a thing that it describes even in the New Testament. Uh, but then we see when the disciples are with Jesus, some ask, well, why don't they fast? He says, well, the bridegroom's with them. You know, fasting was this sense of usually a, a grief before God and, and like a humbling, but, but this was a time of rejoicing. Jesus was saying they're with the bridegroom. Uh, so that's part of, part of that. And so maybe some of that's moved on into the Christian scope today that we say, well, we, we know Jesus, we can celebrate, but we still see fasting in other places in the New Testament. Is there any significant significance to three days of fasting? Is that what they it all was three? You know, I, I'd have to look again in the uh, back to the Pentateuch and see if if the three was a specific thing that was suggested or or asked for i'm not sure on that right now victor but it's a good well, question I think i'll note that in, in the everything is based on like the three and the seven a seven day fast three day fast and then jesus fasted for 40 days mm -hmm. so you see the numbers play out in the pulse for fasting based on testament mm -hmm. Yeah, so it very well could be that maybe if three wasn't commanded, it's kind of become like this, this thing. And, and maybe Esther had in mind how she was going to do this. We're going to see that her plan actually took three days. So maybe she knew that. Maybe she had that in mind from the start, that she was going to have this three-day plan. So she wanted them to be praying and fasting during all of it. Uh, could be. So if, anything else that you wanted to talk about here? Otherwise, I'd really like to zero in near the end of this chapter. So when Mordecai, of course, goes to her and realizes and is one, wants her to know that he needs to deliver her, he says some really important stuff. And if we're going to see God in this book anywhere, like we said, we can see him everywhere. But wow, in these verses, you see his faith. Without having to say God work by, with his words, we see it here. Look, I mean, just look at... Uh, Verse 12 and, and, and following, uh, Mordecai's words, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. So first he appeals, you know, this is going to affect you too, but it's really what he says now. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your fa father's family will perish. Where do you see the faith in that statement? That uh, it will happen eventually somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, the ultimate deliverance, and and you know, as people won't be wiped out. I mean, that's good you brought that up, Melissa, because you know there is this promise of a Messiah that will come, 
And so, yeah, a deliverance will come from somewhere else. Whether or not Mordecai had all that in mind, we don't know. But we, it does seem is that he trusted God would figure it out. This sure seems like, wow, he wants Esther to figure this out right now. I think he's starting to realize. But even if she doesn't do it, he has the faith to recognize that God will find a, another way. He's God after all. Uh, let's see. I think there's maybe a question on that. Yeah, he's he's encouraging her. Um, and, and he's just told her about everything that's happened, the whole edict. Uh, so that was so we're kind of looking at number five right now. The three points we already talked about the first one that she alone wouldn't be spared and that God would bring about relief and deliverance, not only through her, but maybe through someone else. But let's apply this to us. I think number six, it'd be a good thing to discuss here. Um, well, first, we should look at that quote. So she says the deliverance could come from somewhere else. But look at the last half of 14. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Anything on that? Daniel? I wanted to mention the fact that basically I... I like what Esther first says because she's using common sense, right? Yeah. So it's not going to get there to death, but it's like it's going to get me put to death, right? Yeah. And the uh, so what happens then is, of course, Mordecai speaks of God that didn't show us a queen and thinks of reasons and things like that. Then she is she is open to them. Because mm -hmm. we've all we've got to let it because I mean, if she were to just go, oh, sure, I'll do that, that would be careless. Right? Yeah. Right. No, once again. I think last time the phrase I we found ourselves saying over and over in study was believers making difficult decisions in difficult times. And we see another example of that here where Mordecai, or, or yeah, we see Esther thinking, what, I'm not just going to walk into certain death. Yeah. And Mordecai basically is saying, you know, I understand that, but you're walking into certain death if you don't do that as well, right? He's, yeah, we're, they're reasoning this out. God doesn't say that we should just run straight to death. If we know that it's there. You know, that's what... Some did in early ancient times of the church, thinking that's what won favor with God. But no, God's given us our reason and intellect for a reason to use as we serve him. That doesn't mean we fear death, but it means that we, we're smart about it. Uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel. That Yeah, it's really interesting to see them wrestling with this. I think, too, that when you see that um, you're talking to people, just he's saying to her, just because you're sitting on the easy seat doesn't mean that, these, that this won't affect you. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing, you know. Some people think, well, I don't need God. I'm sitting pretty in a pretty seat right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you do because that judgment is coming. Yeah, yeah. In this case, they knew it. Mm -hmm. uh, specific judgment that was coming. This yeah. edict on the Jews, you know. And I don't. Who knows if his? Well, someone else relayed this message to him, of course, or to her. But who knows if they like he meant that to be biting? But I think he was just trying to wake her up to the how serious this was. So do you remember, she's in the palace. All the information she's getting on this is from these messages from Mordecai. So he does kind of have to be to the point and yeah, get to it. So yeah, who knows that if you've been raised to your, to your royal position for such a time as this, talk about recognizing how God has put us in the places and around the people that, that he wants us to be in. But yet there's comfort in this, right? We can have the same assurance that Mordecai did, that even if we fail to act on the things that God puts before us, God's deliverance will come from another thing, another place. But one thing to take from these verses, I think, is to be looking around and see the opportunities that God has put us in to say, you know, maybe God has put me here for such a time and place as this uh, to walk. I'm just when I was canvassing with Laura just now, this guy was out at his mailbox putting his garbage can away, and he looked like he could hardly walk. He was like three houses down. I was like, oh, I don't want to. But then I was like, no, 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 let's just go talk to him. And sure enough, his his father, he said, is inside dying from cancer. And it's kind of like, wow, like maybe we were at such a time and place, you know, just for this, how, how awesome. And we were able to talk to him and, and you know, just and that's, of course, with canvassing. But I'm talking even in just everyday life, just a certain kindness you showed to someone. It's so when Jesus says, you know, what you did for the least of these, you did for me. Just when you give that person a listening ear for a little longer, you know, that you do that for Christ. God sees you. Maybe he puts you in that place to do that. Um, you know, the, and the, this is in the New Testament, too. One of the most well-known verses, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves and not by works so that no one can boast. Um, but then it says, for we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. 
So the good works don't earn our salvation. We already heard that, but he has prepared things in advance for us. So we can learn from Esther and Mordecai's example here to look around and see our opportunities to, to go and serve God with where he's placed us. But if we've missed any, we say, God, I'm sorry, but I trust that your deliverance will come from another place as it, as it always does. That was a lot of talking there, feedback, or I mean, feedback, pushback, anything like that. I mean, that too, if you, if you think, wow, Vicar, you're way off right. base, please do. <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah, just to echo that, right? It's not, it's not our words, our deeds that mm -hmm. does these good things, right? But at the same time, I mean, clearly it says that you have free will to refuse that, right? So something to keep in mind. You know, like like the opportunities God puts before us. Yeah, exactly, saying, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, human will will say always, right? Yeah. That to be rebellious, rebellion against that, right? Yeah, you're that's saying, true. You're driving by, you're saying, oh, no, and then you realization, right? So it's kind of a... Yeah. No, absolutely. It's fighting yeah. against us. But yeah, God, God's work is ultimately what is done, but he uses us. And what an what an honor to be his servant and used to do God things. Wow. We are his arms and, and hands in this world as his as his believers. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, chapter four. I mean, like we said, Esther is this narrative that just keeps rolling. And we left you at a cliffhanger at the end of four. So let's go see it how how Esther goes about while they're fasting for her and praying. Let's listen to chapter five. Five. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, Come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, in all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate. His wife, Zirish, and all his friends said to him, Have a pole set up, reaching to a height of 50 cubits, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted him, and he had the pole set up. Chapter right. 6. So there you got your first taste of the Haman voice of, from this narrative here. <laughs> that Jew, Mordecai. <laughs> yeah. Probably didn't exactly sound like that. It's like the... It's like those, all those movies where it's like, oh, you know that's the villain right away. And the kids' movies, they got the voice, but... But yeah, lots of lots of things going on here. Let's kind of look at the first half first. The where Queen Esther does her request. Any thoughts or or questions, observations on that part? Verses one to one to eight. It's almost like um, you began your prayer. It's a it's a it's a format of how respectful she is in saying everything that she says. If it pleases you, King. If it's up to you know, mm. she is very humble. So she comes in, uh, and that's the way we should come in in prayer. Yeah. It's interesting you're making that parallel with how she approaches the king. I hadn't thought about that before, but yeah, definitely. We approach our king with humility, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. How often do we forget we're praying to the king of the universe? You know, we should, 
we come with a little humility too. Yeah. Thankfully, we know he's not going to destroy us because yeah. of his son. But yeah, yeah. thank you, you know. Anything else? And we should have, as I scrolled by, I thought, oh, we should have looked at seven just one last time on the last page. Just remembering that as we do have those things around us that God gives us to do, what did Esther do first? She asked that they fast and therefore probably pray for her. You know, it's, a, you know, as we do these things, we ask God's help that we can do it the best we can that he's put before us. Just wanted to quick mention that too. Uh, so yeah, we see Esther, Esther, and, and uh, we were wondering, wow, would the, would, how would the king respond? Well, he sees her and he's pleased with her, it says, and, and held out the gold scepter that was in his hand. And a note we should look at from verse four or from chapter four was that it had been 30 days since Esther had been summoned to the king. So this, that really added to it uh, that, you know, it kind of seems like King Xerxes just used Esther whenever he wanted for, you know what, and not much more. So we can see why Esther would have feared so much going to him unannounced. And it seems, well, he's pleased with her. Was it because of her beauty? What did she say something? Who knows? But he extended the scepter, which was that, that sign that she could approach. Can I make a, a, a point? Please, Alex. Okay, so back in that time, marriage was more or less about how we could find money. Oh, yeah, out, absolutely. And more about like politics, especially in that quadrant. But to, to make a point about it, right? Like, even back in like, I don't know, like 14th or 15th century Europe, right? Families would marry each other. Like, you had a range marriage. Yeah. Right? So, like, you would marry like, um, a man or you know, father would take his daughter and marry her off to the next village to like for like mm -hmm. relations between villages. Mm -hmm. right? So it's yeah, it's different. But yeah. in this case, though, I mean, it doesn't seem like Xerxes married Esther for any sort of a political front. He didn't even know what it seems what Esther's people were. So I'm not disagreeing with you that would, we just look at marriage a little different. I would I would say that well I mean I mean he maybe he saw her charm and, and how she could she, be a better well, I mean, forward think about than how fit she the position was because of her ability to politics. Right? Yeah, that's could be yeah. So yeah, we don't know why he ultimately pleased her though right. she pleased him the way she did, but it could have been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're right, we don't want to think of it like the modern sense of yeah. marriage. That's a good reminder. So yeah, uh, we see his reaction there and uh, notice her strategy here. What do you think about that? We had like almost the double feast. Maybe the first time you read it, you think, did I? Did we just read that? But no, she, she asked him to a feast once again. And I misspoke earlier. It looks like this was two days. I'd forgotten that the feast the first time looks like it was the same day. Uh, but, but yeah, she asks for another feast. Why do you suppose she did that? Any ideas out there? I mean, it's speculation, but... Um, and then it, just purely from a structural point of view, I think it may just be because that's uh, one of the one of the elements of like the phone call, which is basically yes, right? Mm -hmm. Like the like the three the, the three days of fasting, three is a common number throughout you know you like various fairy tales and the other kind of thing. And I'm not saying that this is a fairy tale, I'm saying it is a Jewish folk tale, so it's gonna have certain structural things that happen to that to build up attention, right? Sure. So um, and plus you need to tell it. A really good way to frame. Sure. Sure. See, it's interesting. So, would you say that, like you're saying, with how it was put together? Because I'd say we'd we'd have no reason not to read this as history. What are you saying in the way it's presented? Yeah, it's always presented. Okay. Okay. So it's more uh, not in the memo. Sure. sure. I would also say we don't we don't the context that's left out is we don't understand like Persian like a custom. Yeah, that's true. Politics. Group. Yep. Could have been a normal thing to, yeah, to do that true. again. There's a lot we don't know. Yeah. Well, um, um, okay. well, the thing, the other thing, if you look at it, these are court procedures, uh, how you act in court as far as the royal court. Mm -hmm. So she has to, to, to follow certain protocols. And those protocols are still, uh, as we just saw with uh, King Charles being Oh, yeah. You mm -hmm. just saw traditional things that go back uh, for centuries of how they do things. And so that's outlined all in Esther about uh, you can't go into the king unless he summons you. 
If you do, you, you risk being jailed. So all those things are in here. They're factual things of, of, of court law. Mm -hmm. So it's not like um, someone made it up. That's yeah. the way the court, that's the way you proceeded when you went into the court. And we just saw us affect, you know, here recently with the King's coronation. Yeah. I'm also thinking, she had, like you said, she hadn't seen him in 30 days, right? Or something of that nature, to where she's kind of letting the king know, you know, in a way, I'm still here, right? It's like keeping, it's like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. You know, coming to him, inviting him to a banquet, you know, let, you know, it's like, you know, letting, so she still has that position. Yeah. To not lose her position, you know, yeah. in any way. Mm hmm. Yeah, ultimately we we do a lot of speculating why why the the two feasts. I mean, could it be that she wanted to make sure he was still in this mood, you know, with such gracious favor to her, and this wasn't just some drunken thing or whatever, something like that. But what you said, that's another way. In one sense, that puts that puts her in charge. See, by doing the second banquet, and I'll tell you the answer, but only if we can have the second. Banquet. Yeah, it's like she's now she's kind of taking control. Yeah, yeah, suddenly now the king's kind of following her yeah. her will. Uh, yeah, interesting. Let's do kind of let him know. You know, kind of let him think he's still running things, but really she's running. Plus, <laughs> because she knows how the court works. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever, whatever it was, whether. You the whole yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> So what, whatever it was, whether it was like, you know, we're kind of on two spectrums here. Was this like a, a really, really good political move? Because we do see in six, when she does reveal to the king, she does it very, like a very, very good diplomacy. Like she presents it in a really good way. Or was it that she just got kind of fearful? I mean, those are kind of two possibilities, two opposite ends of the spectrum. We don't know. But whatever it is, what we're about to read in chapter six, none of it would have happened if she didn't ask for another day. And just keep that in mind contingency in this book where God is just working things where it seems like just this this decision who knows maybe it wasn't a normal thing maybe it wasn't but whatever it was God used this extra night and then we're gonna really dig into all the coincidences that then happen coincidences right God God working things so then we see Haman's rage against Mordecai and we can definitely learn a few things about I think things like greed and envy from what we see with Haman here anything you want to add to that um Verses nine to fifteen. Probably quote more quote to the expression to the fact of us in framework that we live in today and based off of Christianity. So yeah. Definitely something I could see I can imagine that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because the two tier system is very uh, it's very real in in that culture in, in that time and I mean it went on forever, even now you see. Uh and Here's this guy who feels at this level, and anyone who's below that is supposed to have reverence for him. I mean, he's not the king, but he's at that level where he expects to be treated in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And it really irks him yeah. that someone who is of that low level doesn't show him the reverence. So it's Really, especially, really yeah, especially from the people he's gonna destroy, right? Because I mean, he, the first thing he does is he goes over, he tells his friends, he tells his wife, "Look how important I am." Yeah. And there's this guy that I could care less about. Me. Right. But yet, Nothing. but yet he cares so much about what this what this guy thinks of him, right? I mean, he's he's in this moment where he could be really joyful. Look at this, verse nine. He went out that day happy and in high spirits, and he had lots of reasons to be. I mean, he got invited to this exclusive banquet with just the king and the queen. Like, whoa, talk about high status. But then he sees this one guy that's been disrespecting him. And it's like, throw all that good stuff out the window. I mean, it's so, but we see that in ourselves too, right? So many things could be going well. And, but then greed and envy or, or whatever it might be, it, we, we see something else. And, and we're just like, oh, but I don't have that. Or, you know, that really upsets me. And we just forget about the good that's already right before us. And uh, we, we, I mean, Haman is just a classic example of that. Like he brags to all of them, like you said, Victor, that, you know, look at all this, I'm, I'm this important, but that Jew Mordecai, he's, he's still out there, you know, so I, I can't be happy right now. Um, he would be yeah. a narcissist. Yeah. 
you know, this is logical definition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's if, true. If it demonstrates the importance of who you hang around, like if everybody who's hanging around is like, you know what, you're really going up. This is kind of nuts. But they're like, his wife and his yeah. friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. You want your kill. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Reminds me of a um, like, oh, I'll make a for you. yeah, if your friends are telling you, that's probably not a good friend. <laughs> yeah. 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 This reminds me of the uh, exit of a Polish shaver manual I read. Uh, <laughs> You're the only one that would come with that yeah. knowledge for us, Alex. I love this. <laughs> one of the like the only people that we have, um, like a prolific writer from the Polish Korean Commonwealth. Mm. Bad context, that doesn't matter. <laughs> he has a whole story. He has a lot of stories. Um, one of his stories is that he just went into a town, and since he's a nobleman, he just went to somebody's half-built house and put all of his horses in there and just slept in their house. Yeah. And they came in and tried to get him out of the house, and he like mortally wounded them, and then was like, okay, whatever. And then went on to the next town to do mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah, this so, idea yeah. of that, that. And that was in the, mind you, that's in the 1600s. Yeah. Right? I mean, well, we yeah, see it in every age, right? The, right? How power can get to one's head. And and uh, actually, his, his exact words is I'm more concerned about uh, getting arrested for this more than I by the king than I am that person's health. Yeah. It's easier to escape a village than it yeah. is a, a dungeon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, more malicious than the thing about how the people that surround him. People in those positions thrive on adulation, and if you and, and if you're around those people, they expect to be receive that, that adulation, and and it's like they feed off that. They need it. It's like it's like almost if you want something, you're going to have it as long as. You give them what they want, which is complete total. Oh yeah, you you could do this, you could do that. You're the best. You're the greatest. You're the blah blah blah. And mm -hmm. that's what his type of person. And uh, it, it, it's, I mean, he represents a lot of people in those positions. I mean, that's having insane. having having yeah. been born in a third world country and having been a, 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 under a, a a despot leadership, totalitarian. Regime, the first few years of my life, you heard about it, you felt it around you all, all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was to the leader, the leader of the country. Yeah. You know? So he's yeah. the same thing. And the people around him were, were the same way. Exactly. Yeah. And whatever you want. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like Melissa said, let's surround ourselves with people that we know will, well, especially Christians, right? That will remind us of humility and, you know, like, we don't. We aren't owed anything uh, from from a, from another or from God. We 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 uh, you know we practice that humility. Uh, the author of the People's Bible quotes Proverbs sixteen eighteen, which was that was actually a, a verse that I got to write a devotion on in Lent, uh, and it's just such a such a true truism. I mean, it's a proverb in the Bible, so of course it is. But pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, and we are going to literally see that here. Just when more uh, Haman is on what he thinks maybe the highest point of his life, if it weren't for Mordecai, but he's going to take care of that tomorrow. I mean, look at the confidence of it that, that you know, if I, I mean, and you can see why he's thinking that, you know, while well, he's got his friends supporting him in it. But, you know, he's about to go have a banquet with the king and queen. If he has to kill some one guy, they're going to say yes. You know, he's almost making that assumption in building this thing. Notice 50 cubits high, that's like 75 feet. <laughs> so I mean it's it's not the narrative it's it's the quote so who knows if like that was kind of like a you know you know exaggeration like just, just make it huge you know but maybe they actually did build build the gallows but it also could have been an impaling so it would be hard to imagine how they'd impale someone that high but yeah I mean the point is like make it impressive how you how you get rid of them even uh yeah but we'll see that watch out for pride because it comes before a fall and this is the extreme of it but we certainly learn lessons to watch out for it in ourselves too. Any last thoughts on on this chapter? Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. It's awful. Yeah, it is awful. But we won't Yeah, it stands out. I think 
it's a, you know, number six is a little bit of a silly question, right? I mean, what made him temporarily happy first and five was, you know, the, these physical things, right? The, the queen and quite, you know, the queen and the banquet he was going to get to have. What would have made him truly happy? Well, of course, finding peace and contentment with God and not, not uh, in these things. But Haman was clearly wanting nothing to do with the God of Jewish people. All right. I'm so hanging on waiting to hear. That. All right, let's do it. This is chapter six. So remember when we talked about the center? We talked about how this book kind of is is put together in a tapestry that that centers on a middle chapter. Chapter six is that chapter. And when we get to the end of this, I'll put it all on the board and help you see. Wow, that's so cool! It all comes together. Well, we actually might even watch a video on that. But Esther six, we see everything turn. Let's let's listen to it. And remember, what we're about to read in six wouldn't have happened if she didn't ask that extra day of a banquet. So that's an important fact to keep in mind. That night, the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigfana and Tirish, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded him. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested. For Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate, do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He rode Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. He told Zerush his wife and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zerush said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried him in away to the banquet of Esther Chapter. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there you see it. The, uh, the biggest moment of the dramatic irony as he describes this amazing way to be honored only to hear that it's for his mortal enemy instead. Uh, any other, any, anything, there's lots to talk about here, but actually I think the best way to, to start talking about this would, let's actually do something on the sheet for once, how about it? Uh, we're gonna look at each of these verses and remember that theme again of God's providence and working in all things and how all of this worked together. We already talked about how that extra day worked out. So how did the Lord's extra day or use the extra day between banquets to set up Haman's fall and Israel's deliverance? Uh, let's. Let's break this up and we'll give a, we'll do a little group work on a Wednesday study. How about it? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six little sections. So let's see how we can do this. Verse one, Chris and Patty and, um, and Kim, how about that? You guys can do verse, verse one and look for two coincidences there. So remember the overarching question is how did the Lord use the extra day between the banquets? So look at verse one, uh, Greta and Victor, you guys mind being alone for this one? I'll let you do verse two. And I'll let the end of this table, and, and one of you can go over there if you'd like to, to do verse three. And then verse four, um, these three right at the end, look at verse four. And then verses six to nine, we'll have uh, maybe these three, or just you'll split it up as you'd like here. And then you guys will do the last section, verse 10. So, Christy, you guys all do it. Right. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Verse 10. And then on, on Zoom, you just, I mean, they're pretty easy questions. Feel free to just dive in and take a look at the coincidences at each spot, Peter, if you'd like. Let me get some water. 
All right, we'll start wrapping it up and bring it back together here. All right. So we see a lot of things happening here, how God used this extra day, don't we? Uh, let's just I think we can rapid fire around the room. What did you find in verse one? Any two coincidences? Did you guys find any? Because Satan's um, supposed to be talking to so yeah, his accomplishments, his, his chronicles, so, yep, yep, kingly things. I mean, we were just talking about that. It kind of characterizes Xerxes a little bit, but and maybe you know, as a king, you want to be aware of the things that have happened and not forget about things and, and maybe act on things that haven't been acted on, like this. Okay, thank you. Verse two. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Because he had requested to have the rest of him, so he found out that the person who messed up that assassination attempt yeah. or, or alerted him. Well, you're stealing Victor's thunder here. You're leaving a lot of... <laughs> 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 so anyways, <laughs> careful. Remember, he was already ready to fight Greg. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, that's right. Well, us now. All right, so we found two coincidences there. Yes, what what did the Chronicles reveal, Cruises? What did they reveal? Just so happened to be the section they read. Uh, well, I don't know, Chris. Why don't you? Know? <laughs> <laughs> it just happened to be that he discovered that Mordecai had saved life. He didn't even know that. I mean, hey, this guy is Mordecai. He actually told you about the two eunuchs and declined to kill me. Yeah, wow. absolutely. What, what has been done, you know, for him? Oh, I guess he didn't ask that yet. Now I'm doing it. Verse three, a question. <laughs> Start a question. <laughs> this guy saved my life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Verse four, a thought and a coincidence and irony. So we were talking about, well, we felt like there were several similar moments going on here. Like there was the huge uh, in payment walking into the court. Right at, at the time that the king is like, well, who is in the court? Right, Haman was ill intentioned, was walking into the yeah. court, 
But in his mind, he's like, I'm right where I need to be. I'm going to get him to look at me, right? And the king is like, where is, you know, where is Mordecai, right? So instead, the coincidence is he's, he's overlooked, even though he is, feels like he's probably right where he needs to be mm -hmm. to carry out his uh, sinister plan. So, um, yeah. If he hadn't been there, maybe they would not have had any other altercation. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he hadn't come right then, he probably would have had someone else lead the procession or give the suggestion yeah. of what to do for Mordecai. But no, it's Haman that, well, who's out there? Oh, Haman, he'd do it. You know, that really was what happened. He just, and like you said, the irony of it is he was coming to kill Mordecai. Yeah. But yeah, then he now he was going to be the one to, well, let's not give it away from verses six to nine. So <laughs> completely intent, unintended advice. What did they give you? Verses well, six to nine. What we got was the, the, the fact that the king basically said everything that you know he wanted to do and never mentioned Haman. You know what I'm saying? Or Mordecai. I mean, he could have mentioned, hey, what should I do with Mordecai? Da, 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 da. He didn't even mention his name. He just mentioned all this stuff about what what he wanted, you know, what should we do? And then Haman gives him this answer about everything you should do. And it's like, you know, he had no idea it wasn't about himself. Yeah. It was about Mordecai. Yeah. yeah. And there it is, the complete well, thing. Like, we're not going to talk about who this is about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, there's these people, there's this guy. <laughs> His name's mentioned. Well, because he, he could have, he could have think about it. You know, you, you say things and God puts words in your mouth sometimes and you just say things you don't realize what you're saying. And so he said, you know, the king said this stuff and and asked his, he could have said, what should I do for Mordecai? But he didn't say that. Yeah. He said, what should I do for this person? You know, and, uh, yeah, yeah and, and then Mordecai, uh, Haman starts letting all this stuff go. Yeah. Because he's thinking Yeah. He makes a foolish assumption. And, and it's yeah, foolish assumption for sure. And you can and take advantage of the situation. Say, oh, y'all, I can get it right now. Well, and, if he felt like yeah. this is what he deserved. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I would love this. And I would love mm -hmm. this. You know? And then it was like, yeah, but you, I'm talking about Mordecai. Who are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yep. Instead, you should be afraid of writing problems. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. All right. Finally, verse 10, a most demeaning irony. The most demeaning irony was that Haman was doing the walking low and Mordecai was doing the riding high. Yeah. yeah. I liked the way that the uh, the dramatized NIV did it. With, he was just, do these things for Mordecai the Jew. You know, it's that little pause. I don't know if he would have done that, but but no, I mean, it just it really emphasizes, wow, that unex how unexpected it must have been. And wow, I would pay so much money to see Haman's face. I mean, as soon as he heard that, man, just the who <laughs> he said what? But what's interesting, we don't even see him talk after it. I mean, it kind of represents how he probably was feeling. You know, just just this. We, like, he just go at once. Well, he talks when he's doing saying the thing, but he just so Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback. Uh, he just, you know, he he does it. He's got to be so ashamed. And he, so, I think he, I think he's shaking in fear. He already knows. Oh, he already yeah, knows. He's, yeah. he's walking a slow walk now. Well, I think he's also <laughs> shame, he's hurt. I mean, because it's you know, it's basically like he deserves something. All of a sudden, you don't get it. Yeah. It's like a promotion. Yeah, it's like or, you know, you can't believe that the king did this to me. You know, so yeah, absolutely. Like, so I deserve it. I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Karen. Sure. Okay. Okay. The 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 verse ten. Where the king tells Haman to quickly take blood of the horse and do as you have said for the non part of Jew, he says the palace leave nothing in this We've got nothing. To do. Is he basically going to ride on the horse with the pole to go and tell Mordecai with it? I mean, things like that, right? Yeah. I mean, he's like jousting, you said? No. No, so this would be like, like he was going to be the one leading this horse. That and these horses would have been ornamented in these beautiful turbans and things we know from Persian culture and from Herodotus and other writers that you know they would have been all in these beautiful robes, not even just Mordecai, but the, the horses too. And he would lead them through the town. And then we see from before that that he's saying, 
you know, he has to say, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. That's what he has to yell. And then, and then that's what he says instead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no jousting. He just has to, Mordecai's already won. <laughs> Yeah. I noticed when they when he's like like he like, oh, it's gonna be for him. Yeah. No, it's gonna be for him. Yeah. So very like showy, like let me show everybody how much the king enjoys yeah. me. Yeah. And let's do this for me. Like this is this will show everybody. Yeah. So he he still was very I mean that. Yeah, that pride again, right? That power. <laughs> yeah. Narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I mean and again, like why does he think that? Why is he so confident to go to this level? Well, he's getting invited to the exclusive feasts. You know, this is the day of the feast. Who else would he want to honor right now? I mean, he's probably thinking about me. I'm at the feast with him. Um, and and like Melissa wrote, brought up his friends, just told him, you know, yeah, do what you got to do, man. Like, you're the best, you know? And so if if that's what you're hearing, then yeah, he's going to go the next day thinking nothing can stop him. You start to think you're almost immortal, and we are reminded quite quickly, pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And yeah, he really missed on this one. Yeah. I think also, you know, it's beautiful, like you said, to watch God work a plan from the book that gets read to the name that comes up. Oh, yeah, we forgot to, you know, recognize this guy. It's beautiful to watch it. And then also... It could barely easily been that Mordecai was just mentioned and he figures out, oh, he wants to honor Mordecai. But now he's making, he actually has to walk with him. You know, he has to prepare yeah. him for this whole thing and walk and speak even. Yeah. Say, he, here's the great guy. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, but it's just really neat to watch God's family work and how it kind of all turned mm -hmm. around. Or went to yeah. person. Well, like Joseph said, what they what he meant for evil, God meant for good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It okay. should it should teach humble you know humble, humble him in some way in some way. I would just say that periodically man he would be humbled by this situation. You know, well, issue, anybody's humble. He was just talking to his friends about how good say all that man. He's like. The guy that he wants to kill is like, he's like, hey, this is the greatest like, man on earth. Yeah. Look at him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 like, oh, you found against him. That's really nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Because so, you know, his friends are going to laugh at him. Oh, yeah, not to his face. Well, right. oh, yeah, to his face, they're going to say, well, as we'll see, you're dead. I mean, literally, that is what they say, which is interesting. Please, Alex, we're just about at time. So, yeah. We were just talking about this, like, that, uh, level of providence in this, right? The life of Jesus. This, right? Mm. Like, what we were just, like, guessing what was keeping him up at night, right? The person that this lawful war was before. Yeah. Right? Uh, 300 guys. No, no that was really. Oh, no, he's saying, yeah. In Greece. In Greece, in Greece right? yeah, he lost like, the, the whole, God literally had to construct a war, right? To make, to bring this to the yeah right? probably yeah yeah you know those are the mm. you know it's kind of I always make the people of providence always make a uh what i always first thing i go to is christ crucifixion god had to make the roman republic the roman empire right had to expand it all the way to israel right had to bring our, it's true yeah. and, and, and he said that was right? you know that was the time and the set time had fully come you know right. getting that already absolutely no i mean there's always going to be more to god's providence uh, and we'll talk a little more next time specifically about God's providence and the things we can say, things we can't say. And But yeah, what a great place to stop the turning point of the book. Um, any, I didn't ask before, any quick prayer requests? They don't have to be quick, but any prayer requests for tonight? You said your brother? John? Stage four cancer. He has pneumonia really bad. Um, he has a punctured lung. Oh, wow. So he's in critical condition right now. Yeah, so, we'll certainly be praying for him. All right. Anything else? All right. My, my oh, sir, we uh, always pray for the homeless, too. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's pray for the homeless. Starting to get really hot during the days for them, opposite problems that they've dealt with before. So, all right, let's pray. 
Lord God, we thank you for uh, bringing us into the book of Esther today so that we could could be here, that, that the ways that you've ordered our lives has brought us here to gather around your word. What a blessed thing. Help us not to take that for granted and to trust in you. Uh, that you are ordering our lives and, and our steps uh, so that we are in your good grace and, and uh, protected. Uh, help us to see the moments where, where you, that you placed before us for such a time to, to serve you and, and, and uh, serve our neighbor and therefore serve you through that. And Lord, knowing that you are in control of all things, we bring to you uh, Sandy's brother, John, as, as he, he's in state for cancer and pneumonia and, and the punctured lung, Lord, it seems this long list of, of things is, is he's up against right now. Uh, we, we, we put him into your hands. We ask you to bless the doctors to work with him and ultimately use this to, to grow his faith and to grow and to bring him closer to you. And then, Lord, we pray for all those who are homeless, especially around uh, our city here. Uh, as it gets warmer and warmer, Lord, help them to have the help that they need uh, beyond just food and drink, but let them know you and uh, hopefully get back on their feet soon so that they can they can uh, continue to, to live in good health and, and uh, maybe give Christians the opportunity to show their love and light to them uh, in the days to come. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.